Good morning. Welcome to the 81st Landon Lecture on Public Issues. Before I introduce Ambassador Walters, let me introduce to you other members of the platform party. On my left, Troy Lubers, senior in business and our student body president. Let's give a Troy big hand. <clears throat> Next, Dr. James Kelliker, professor of civil engineering and president-elect of the K-State Faculty Center. <clears throat> On my right, Ed Seaton, publisher of the Manhattan Mercury and chairman of the Landon Patrons. <clears throat> Next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, presidential assistant and chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. Well, I'm very pleased this morning to introduce to you General Vernon Walters, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Ambassador Walters was nominated as the United States Permanent Representative to the U.N. by President Reagan on February 8, 1988. In this position, he serves as a member of the President's Cabinet. Prior to his appointment to the United States Mission to the U.N., Ambassador Walters served as ambassador at large from 1981 to 85. In this job, he traveled to over 108 countries covering a million and a half miles as the Reagan administration's chief diplomatic troubleshooter. Mr. Walder served in the United States Army from 41 to 76, retiring with the rank of Lieutenant General. In the course of his military career, he served as special aide to Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Nixon on their many foreign travels. During World War II, he served in North Africa and Italy. He also served in Greece during their civil war and subsequently in both the Korea and Vietnam struggles. In 1972, General Walters was named Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Agency and during that period was Acting Director for five months. In addition to many articles and book reviews, General Walters has written his memoirs in a book entitled Silent Missions. His other books include Sunset at Saigon and The Mighty and the Meek. Ambassador Walters is fluent in seven foreign languages. He is the recipient of many honors and distinguished service awards, including the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, and the Air Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Walters. President Weifold, uh, students and guests here, I am delighted and honored to have been asked to speak in such a distinguished forum as the Forum of the Landon Lectures. I am very happy to have uh, been selected to talk to you on the subject of the United Nations. When I arrived here yesterday, I was handed to the local college newspaper, and I feel there are a number of terminological inexactitudes that should be set straight not just for personal reasons, but for the fact that you are supposed to be taught the truth. So if I may take them just before I get to the United Nations. I see when it says, first of all, that I served 40 years in the US Army. I served 36. It then said that I had the distinction of being directly or indirectly involved in overthrowing more governments than any other official in the US government. I can't figure out how so many people vote against us in the United Nations if I've overthrown all our enemies. Uh, <laughs> according to a summer 1986 article in Covert Action, it's the first magazine I've ever been the cover boy on. It was a fantastic thing. At my age, you know, you don't expect to get it when you're 70. Uh, Walters freely acknowledged his involvement in the 53 coup which ousted the government of Premier Mohammed Mossadegh. I was in Iran in 1951. In 1953, I was the assistant to a French general at the NATO headquarters in Paris. This is really good remote control. 
In 1964, his military attaché in Brazil, Walters accurately predicted one week in advance the exact day of the coup, which ousted constitutionally elected President João Goulart and installed the military government of General Humberto Castelo Branco. On the morning of the coup, Walters breakfasted with Branco. Well, first of all, as a military attaché, it was my duty, and that's what the U.S. government was paying and keeping me in some luxury to find out what was going on in the Brazilian military. I knew, and I told the U.S. government. On the morning of the coup, I had no idea where Castelo Branco was. I did not have breakfast with him. If I may go on, uh, under Director George Bush, Walters attempted to organize mercenary support for the CIA's covert war in Angola. But once successful in Brazil, Walters did recruit several French mercenaries. I have never recruited a mercenary in my life, French, Brazilian, or any other. Between 1976 and 1981, Walters officially left military service but remained active in various diplomatic roles. That was under the presidency of President Carter, and I wasn't asked to carry on any diplomatic roles. Uh, I traveled to Morocco as a representative, blah, 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 which said that I was hired in an effort to sell tanks to the King of Morocco. I have never sold a tank in my life to the King of Morocco or to anybody else. A year later, I traveled to Guatemala as a goodwill ambassador for the Reagan administration. I was representing Basic Resources International. I was representing Basic Resources International, which was an oil company. I never was a good Reagan goodwill ambassador of any sort. Uh, where shall we go on? Uh, with, the election, with the election of Reagan, Walters returned to government service as ambassador at large when Reagan appointed him in 1985 U.S. Ambassador. During this period, Walters was part of the administration's core Central American policy group, referred to informally by the administration officials as the murder board. Well, I've never heard of it referred to as a murder board. I wasn't a part of it. I had nothing to do with it. I was not involved particularly in setting national Central American policy. As a member, Walters was instrumental in organizing the Contras from the remnants of deposed Nicaraguan dictators Anastasio Somoza National Guard. I have never had anything to do with the organization of the Contras. I have supported aid to them publicly and speaking publicly. I have never had any direct personal contact with the Contras in the sense of organizing anybody to do anything. I go on. In the uh, Iran-Contra connection, Walters used old connections to the military junta in Argentina to secure support and training for the Contras. The Argentines had put on their own hook 100 officers into Central America because they were concerned by what was going on. I didn't ask them to do it. Uh, we go along. Walters traveled to a number of US clients and urged contributions. Both Israel and Egypt donated money in response to the pleas when reminded of the substantial US aid they received. I have never solicited contributions from anybody, Israel, Egypt, or anyone else at any time uh, on behalf Contras. Then as ambassador at large, Walters was instrumental in u renewing U.S. military aid to several Latin countries which had been denied aid by President Jimmy Carter. Rubbish. Never did anything of the sort. Now, I have an editorial, I think, from today, which carries on in this same team. It said, uh, it said I'm going to evade all your questions and not refuse to talk about them and so forth. Well, we'll see when the time comes. Why did Walters abstain from a vote condemning South African elections? I don't remember whether I did, but I am an instructed delegate of the United States and I do what my government tells me. How about the World Court's decision that the CIA broke international law by mining Nicaraguan harbors? A great effort is made to portray the United States as some kind of a black sheep or an evil devil who defies the International Court of Justice. On the International Court of Justice, there are 15 judges representing 15 countries. Ten of those countries, like us, reject the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in political matters, and that includes the Soviet Union, China, France, and a great many other countries. We don't reject their jurisdiction on commercial matters. As a matter of fact, we just turned over a couple of hundred million dollars of Iranian assets in the United States to the Iranian government because we were told to by the International Court of Justice. What we do reject, and constitutionally, I don't know how we can accept it, the right of a non-American, non-elected group to tell us to change our foreign policy. There is no country in the world that will accept this. And I think there was one other interesting one. Oh yes, why did the United States, the Reagan administration, downplay the role of the United Nations by appointing Walters to the position without cabinet rank? They're wrong. I am a member of the cabinet and it harasses me. I have to go to Washington twice a week from New York to attend cabinet meetings. I'm also 18th in line of succession out of 256 million people.
I would also point out that the so-called Reagan administration, President Reagan is the only chief of state I know of who has been to the United Nations every year for the last eight years and made a speech there. Now, I don't see how they could think that we were downgrading the United Nations when President Reagan comes there every year and he appoints me as the U.S. personal representative. I can't accept that as downgrading the United Nations. Uh, you know, my, uh, these allegations surface from time to time, and when I'm asked for comment after leering all the governments that I've, oh, there's one little juicy new one that I staged the coup in the Fiji Islands because the Prime Minister wouldn't let us have ship nuclear visits. Well, it so happens that when I went there, he said, by all means, bring the ships in. We had no reason to want to overthrow them. We didn't anyway. And I saw the colonel who conducted the plot. Yes, I did. Fiji Island's a very unusual country. Two-thirds of its armed forces are in the service of the United Nations in peacekeeping. When I got there, they said, you have to go and see the armed forces. I said, why? They said, because two-thirds of their armed forces are serving with the United Nations. So I went there. And the briefing was given by the number two man in the service, who was Colonel Sitiveni Rabuka, who staged the coup a few days later. Fortunately for me, on the day of the coup, I was giving a lunch in New York for the representatives of the Pacific countries, New Zealand, Australia, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, Western Samoa, and Tonga. So if I did, it was by tremendous remote control. But there was no incentive to do it. He'd already told us he didn't mind us bringing in these things. But anyway, my general comment when asked about all these achievements of mine is simply this. On the seventh day, I rested. Two years ago, when I went to Brazil, they had a press conference. They all came in with this coup of 1964. I said, OK, gentlemen, ladies, in the United States, we have a strange law that no one else in the world has called the Freedom of Information Law. You can get any American document more than 12 years old, no matter how secret it is, except for a few very rare exceptions. Uh, the uh, archives of Lyndon Johnson, who was president at the Times Library, have been opened. And I defy you to produce a single document which shows that I was any other, anything other than a well-informed witness. You know, if you study it fundamentally, what advice could an American colonel without coups give to Brazilian generals who would depose two presidents in the previous five years? The answer is not much. This year I went back and I didn't get a single question on this subject. I said, ah, I see that despite my challenge, none of you have been able to produce a single document to support these allegations. And there was a sort of sheeping around and there were no questions on that subject. But now to get to the really interesting part, but this is just a thing of, since I heard the newspaper was a respected and reputed newspaper, I thought it well to draw their attention to the unreliability of some of their sources. Uh, to get to the United Nations. The United Nations is going through a strange and extraordinary period of extraordinary opportunity. For 40 years almost, it was a place of confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. If we said it was black, they said it was white. If we said it was white, they said it was black. Now that is no longer true. For the last two years or year and a half, the permanent members, the United Nations has two basic bodies in it, the Security Council of 15 members. Five permanent members, the Soviet Union, China, Britain, France, and ourselves, have a veto on any resolution in the Security Council. And only the Security Council's resolutions are binding on the members. And the General Assembly, composed of 159 countries. Now, the Security Council is the one charged with the maintenance of peace. At the outset of the United Nations, the United States was charged with paying 40% of the share because the rest of the world had just come through the war and was almost bankrupt. That was negotiated down to the present 25% by my predecessor, George Bush. And if I were 20 years younger, the fact that my predecessor is now the president-elect would give me ideas. But unfortunately, it's a little late in my career. Uh, until recently, there was a great deal of irresponsibility in the United Nations, particularly in the administrative side. What troubled us was the fact that there was a budget, which was preposterous. Uh, let me give you an example of what the sort of thing that disturbed us. Two years ago in Ethiopia, when 1,000 people a day were dying of hunger, they voted to build a $73 million conference center in Addis Ababa, when people were dying in the streets outside. Ethiopia is a communist republic. Lenin's in the main square, and there were sickles and hammers. But that year, the United States gave Ethiopia more food 
than all the rest of the world put together. That sort of thing disturbed us. The fact that there were 83 assistant or undersecretaries of the United Nations uh, and earning very large salaries disturbed us. Uh, there were a number of things that disturbed us about the way the place was run, and in most of them, the Soviet Union, which was then the second largest contributor, agreed with us. So a board of 18 distinguished citizens from 18 different countries was appointed to suggest reforms. The United States decided to withhold 20% of its contribution until that reform was achieved as a form of bringing pressure on them to do so. This group of 18 made a series of recommendations which have now been carried out. We've gotten the top level jobs dropped from 83 to 60. We've gotten a 15% personnel cut. We've got a budget that has to be adopted by consensus. And we've gotten various other things that we wanted to get. So the administration has paid about two thirds of our dues for the last two years. Now you understand the administration can't pay money unless authorized by Congress, and Congress has refused to authorize, authorize us to pay more than $144 million of our $200 million contribution. But we have recognized the debt, we have recognized the arrearages, and we are drawing up a plan to pay them. Uh, I myself was always in favor and always recommended to both the administration and the Congress that we pay these dues. The other day when I handed a check for $120 million to the Secretary General, I said, Mr. Secretary General, if you see any bloodstains on this check, they're type R-O-R-H negative and it's my blood. Uh, we will pay the thing. We have acknowledged the debt and we will pay it. I suggested at one time that if we're not going to pay, why don't we negotiate a lower percentage? And absolutely no one would hear of that, which is an encouraging sign that everybody intends to pay it. I think the United Nations, which was founded to prevent the recurrence of the scourge of war, which twice in the lifetime of the signatories in 1945 had devastated the world, uh, had not done this until very recently. Now, because of what has happened in the Soviet Union, there has been a difference in this. I meet with the, so my Soviet and Chinese and British and French colleagues about once a week, and we discuss anything under the sun. And we discuss it with great frankness, and there is none of this language of this sort of business, of the blood-sucking vampires of Wall Street are sucking the last drop of blood from the veins of the toiling masses of the third world. The North Korean came and made a speech like that, and I said to my Soviet colleague, what do you think of that? He said, it sounds like 1960. We don't talk like that anymore. Uh, and in fact, it's, uh, it's, I find it hard to believe it's the same place I came to three years ago. Now, how did this come about? It came about because an intelligent man like Mr. Gorbachev understood that his system wasn't working. It came about because he understood that he needs access, desperately access, to Western technology, and I include the Japanese. And he cannot get it by smuggling or espionage. Let me give you a case. Nine years ago, the Russians purchased from an American the manual of one of our reconnaissance satellites operating on a completely new principle, not photographic. Seven years later, they put up a crude copy that didn't work very well. They get a computer through some illegal deal. It takes them five years to copy it. Retro engineering is not easy, just you know, taking the thing apart and then building others. I remember when I was a kid, I had a teddy bear, and when I pressed on his stomach, his eyes lit up, and eventually I wore out the battery, and I tried retro engineering. I cut open the teddy bear, and I put in a new battery, but I couldn't get all the sawdust back in, and that was the end of the teddy bear. And they have run into this problem. He understands that. You know, the Soviet Union is the only major nation in the world that has a non-convertible currency. Anybody else's currency, you can convert into other currencies. The Soviet Union, if you go there, they'll charge you $1.80 for a ruble. If you're brave and are prepared to smuggle some in, you could buy them at 25 cents a piece in Switzerland. So Mr. Gorbachev, who's an intelligent man, realized that his economy is in chaos, that the socialist idea has collapsed. He doesn't, isn't prepared to tell them that yet because it takes some time to break the news to them slowly. You know, when you go into the Soviet delegation in New York, there's a darkened room with a bust of Lenin and a single light on it and a bowl of red uh, carnations in front of it. It's an ersatz religion. And how do you tell the people that the God they believed in has failed? I was in Bulgaria. Would you believe with this past I was invited to the Soviet Union, to Bulgaria, to Poland, to Czechoslovakia, and to Hungary? This kind of a monster? Uh, I was the first American representative of the United Nations ever in invited there. 
And I must tell you an amusing incident. When I was there once, columnist Bill Sapphire wrote a column attacking me fiercely. And myself to be invited to Czechoslovakia, to be invited to Poland. <coughs> then I was worried about me as some of these people are. A couple of years ago, I went to see Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro said, if you've come here to threaten me, you should know that I've been threatened by every American president since Kennedy. But I know how your country is won, and I know that none of your congresses is ever going to let any of your presidents do to me what they would like to do to me. And he said, you know, we have one thing at least in common. And I said, what's that, Mr. President? He said, we're both pupils of the Jesuits. And I said, oh, but there's a deep difference. He said, what's that? I said, I remain fidel, which means faithful in Spanish. <laughs> he looked at me and he shook his head sadly and he said, what a pity you're on the other side. <laughs> but anyway, in the United Nations, you see, one of the vital functions of the United Nations, it's not the world government or the future of mankind or anything, but it is an enormously useful forum. The Soviets could not give in to us over Afghanistan, but they could take note of the repeated resolutions of the United Nations voted by something like 125 to 19, telling them to get out. So it gives them a face-saving way of getting out without yielding to the United States. Exactly the same with the Iranians. When the unfortunate incident of the airplane, Iranian airplane shoot down occurred, the Iranians came to New York convinced they would find 20 nations ready to sponsor a resolution to condemn the United States. When they found nobody, not the Soviet Union, not any of the Eastern Bloc countries, not any of the Third World, they suddenly realized how lonely they were, how isolated they were. And at that point, I asked the President Bush, Vice President Bush to come there to state opposition. Sometimes Mr. Schultz stages it, sometimes the president, sometimes the vice president. He told them that we were going to stay the course, that we would not allow the expansion of the conflict into the countries of the Arabian Peninsula, and that we would maintain our naval presence. Three days later, after one year's delay, they finally accepted the United Nations resolution calling for a ceasefire. Now, I received a letter from a lady during that time, and she said, I used to be a Republican, but I'm not anymore. I was disgusted at the way George Bush came and upstaged you at the United Nations. And I wrote back and said, dear lady, he came at my earnest entreaty because I felt his voice would have much more impact on them than mine. She wrote back and said, I re-registered. <laughs> so, war number two. The United Nations is about to conduct a plebiscite in the Western Sahara. Now, the U.S. couldn't conduct a plebiscite in the Western Sahara. The United Nations can't. And I think we'll shut down that war fairly soon. I think in Angola, we will reach a solution. Uh, there was some mention of my support for Jonas Savimbi during the time I was Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. That was what I was instructed to do by my government, and that is what I believed in, and the government today believes we should support Savimbi until we get national reconciliation. In Africa, the real facts are tribal. And Savimbi's tribe represents 45% of the people of Angola. We are urging them to achieve a government of national reconciliation. But of course, unfortunately, it is not in the tradition of any Marxist government to share power with any other party, much less alternate in power with any other party. Nevertheless, I think we are going to see peace there. Now, there's much talk of US and South African aid to Savimbi. And I would say Savimbi, from all sources abroad, has probably received $200 million. The Angolan government gets $3 billion a year from the U.S. government, from the East USSR. The Soviets have given this year Angola more tanks than South Africa has in its inventory, and they still can't win the war. As far as I know, we have not given Sabimbi any tanks, nor have the South Africans, nor has any of the other African countries that are helping him. They help him quietly, but they don't tell it publicly. It's sort of like when we bombed Libya, all the Arab countries voted against us and then lined up to thank me for doing it. And you understand Arab solidarity, we had to publicly vote against you. And of course, as you've noticed, Mr. Gaddafi has been quite quiet since then, except that he's now building a poison gas factory, which we have to see what we do and how the world handles that. Now, in a number of things, we've had big agreements. We've had agreements to abolish chemical warfare. In January 7th, we will have a conference in Paris, and I'm confident that a resolution condemning the use of chemical warfare will pass by 159 votes out of 159. The United States, for 17 years, unilaterally abandoned the manufacture of chemical agents. The United States was the only nation 
which banned the shipping to Iran or Iraq of what we call the precursors, the materials from which poison gas is made. They're exactly the same as they use for insecticides. The others wanted to do the business, we didn't. It's like South Africa. You or the United States isn't in favor of sanctions. I would like to point out the United States applied sanctions to South Africa, prohibiting the sale of military or police equipment to the government of South Africa seven years before the United Nations thought of it. Seven years before the United Nations thought of it. We don't believe in total sanctions because we believe the only place a young black South African can get the kind of technical training that will make him competitive in the freer South Africa tomorrow is by working for a foreign company. And when the foreign companies go, he's going back to manual labor. And we don't think that's in the interest of the black community in South Africa. Not because we like them. We are the fifth largest black power in the world. Only Nigeria, Brazil, Ethiopia, and Zaire have more black people than we do. We are the fifth largest Hispanic country in the world. Only Mexico, Spain, Argentina, and Colombia have more Hispanic-speaking people than we do. You know, if we're so bad, how come that two years ago we had to amnesty 20 million illegal immigrants? People tell you what they really believe with their feet. Nobody's fighting to get out of the United States. An awful lot of people are fighting to get in. Uh, in the United Nations, I must tell you that one of the things I regret is the United States is the only country outside of Japan, industrialized country in the world, where you can get a high school or a college diploma without a foreign language. The only two. And in a world that is growing constantly smaller, that is putting us at a grave disadvantage, politically, economically, in a competitive business sense or any other way. Shortly after I got to the United Nations, the Soviet undersecretary in charge of the uh, Security Council was replaced by another Soviet. And I stood up to make the speech of farewell to him. I was the president of the Security Council, and everybody had their translation microphones off. But when I started out in Russian, there was a mad scramble for earphones. And the United Nations Secretariat sent me a little note and said, you are the first American delegate ever to speak in Russian at the United Nations in the 45 years of that, country, of that organization's existence. So, as I say, we are presented with a unique opportunity. Not just the Soviet Union, but the whole socialist bloc is in some confusion. I was in West Africa recently. Three presidents who had been Marxists, became Marxists when they were young students in Paris, said to me, I became a Marxist at 17. I came back here, I became president, I applied this idea, and it doesn't work. And I'm totally disoriented. I don't know what to do next. Now, if you look at the African countries that didn't, like Senegal, Ivory Coast, uh, Cameroon, uh, Kenya, and others, you find a situation that is entirely different. One of the problems we have in the United Nations is that of the 159 countries there, there are about 44 democracies, 44 or 45 democracies. We are a tiny minority in the General Assembly. And this is one of the problems with which we have to contend. But nevertheless, you don't get the same kind of confrontation. You get discussion. And talking to my Soviet colleagues, the most interesting thing I get is personal opinions for the first time, rather than a parrot-like recital of their government's opinion. I asked three of them, how do you feel about what's going on in your country? One of them said to me, do you know how long we've been waiting for this to happen? Another one said, he's going too fast. He's going to get overthrown. And the third one said, he's going to fail. I said, why do you say he's going to fail? He said, Russians are not used to being asked politely to reform. They are used to being told in no uncertain terms, reform, goddammit, reform. <laughs> and he said, he hasn't told them that. Well, he has told them a little more so since the defenestration of Mr. Gromyko and others. And another thing, a Russian to Russians, they will tell you these kind of stories. One of them said to me, you know, we have the tallest building in the world. I said, you don't. The tallest building in the world is in Chicago. They said, no, the tallest building in the world is the KGB building near the Beltway in Moscow. I said, how can you say that? They said, from the third floor, you can see Siberia. Uh, Another one they told me, which I enjoyed, was one day Gorbachev decided he was going to drive home himself. So he said to the dri driver, you get in the back, I'm going to drive. So the driver got in the back, and he was driving down. He was going too fast. Two motorcycle policemen pulled him over. 
One of them stayed in back to watch. The other one went up to the car. And when he came back to the first policeman, the first policeman said, did you give him a ticket? He said, no. He said, why not? Who was in the car? He said, I don't know, but Gorbachev was driving for him. <laughs> Now, when they tell you these stories, another one I had, when we were working on the Gulf, one of them said to me, I suppose when we finally get peace in the Gulf, you will say, Alhamdulillah, which is glory to God in Arabic. And I said, no, personally, I will say, Our Father, what in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He picked me up and went right on to the end. I said, oh, you know it. He said, everybody in Russia knows it. I said, how does everybody know it? He said, everybody has mama. So, you know, I think there is tremendous positive move. It is difficult for us. How do we help and encourage Gorbachev without giving his enemies ammunition? You know, one of the most dangerous things is to give too much support to someone because you drown them in American holy water. And you only need about two inches of American holy water to drown. The only holy water you need less of to drown is German. You only need one inch of that. And not long ago, the German foreign minister, Mr. Genscher, made a great speech saying that Gorbachev was absolutely fantastic, terrific, we should do everything for him. He was a man of peace, love, and brotherhood, and everything else. And I can just hear Gorbachev's enemies in the Politburo saying, you hear that? Even the Germans like him. <laughs> the problem for us is how to deal with him, to encourage him, without giving his enemies ammunition. Now, one of the reasons we've been able to deal with him is I think it is the contrast and this is a partisan political view, but after all, you heard I was appointed by Mr. Reagan, that our economy is not working badly. Our gross national product is larger than that of Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union put together, who represent half a billion people. Uh, I think the fact that we hung tough. The Germans asked us to put missiles in. The Europeans asked us to put missiles in to match the Soviet ones. The Soviets said, if you put one missile in, they'll never begin beyond negotiation. We put them in. They then invited Mr. Reagan to go to Reykjavik. And in Reykjavik, they said, unless you give up SDI, there will be no further negotiations. The Soviets have been working on SDI for 19 years. There are three academicians of the Soviet Union that are doing nothing else. They've got 19,000 people working on this. We've been working on it for four years, and we're way ahead of them. They said, if you won't give that up, there'll be no negotiations. There were negotiations, because we hung tough. There were negotiations that, for the first time, eliminated a whole category of weapons the theater missiles. But there's still an extraordinary asymmetry in Europe. Facing the 40 divisions of NATO in Europe are the 144 divisions of the Warsaw Pact. Facing the 15,000 tanks of NATO, there are 46,000 Soviet and Warsaw Pact tanks. Facing the 3,000 frontline combat aircraft of NATO, there are 6,000 frontline combat aircraft of the Warsaw Pact. I think Mr. Gorbachev wants peace. I think he wants a breathing period. And I think that we can have successful negotiations. But you don't have successful negotiations with the Soviets by buckling under. You have su successful negotiations by recognizing that they have national interests that you have to respect, but that you have national interests and you have allies that you have to respect. So I see uh, an extraordinary opportunity to do something really positive and to help the Russian people move towards a government that will eventually let them decide their own destiny. You see, the difference between communist dictatorships and non-communist dictatorships is that the communist dictatorships have solved the problem of succession. When the dictator dies, they have a collegial government for a while until one of the collegiates becomes more collegiate than the other, and then you have a standard dictatorship. The dictatorships of Franco, Salazar, the Greek colonels, the Argentine colonels, the Venezuelan colonels, everywhere in the world have eventually been replaced by democracy. No Soviet regime, no communist regime has ever been replaced except by force. And that is something we should bear in mind. The other day we had this extraordinary spectacle in Chile of a military dictator conducting a referendum which he lost. I know of no case where any communist dictator has ever come, conducted a referendum in which he got less than 98% of the vote. So while right-wing dictatorships are reprehensible, you can have some hope left-wing dictatorships, there is no hope on the basis of history so far. Now, of course, eventually they will be washed onto the shore by the wave of history, which they think is on their side. You know, I once said to a Soviet colleague, you know, the difference, the fundamental difference between your country and mine is that in my country the past is fixed and the future is flexible. In your country the future is fixed 
and the past is flexible. Another Soviet said to me, we both belong to great countries. Mine's on the way up and yours is on the way down. And I said to him, Stepanin, when you've walked on the moon, come talk to me. Twelve of my compatriots have walked on the moon. None of yours have. Oh, we left that one there. Uh, but as I say, we have an extraordinary opportunity. And if we play it right, if we play it right, we can bring about a new world in which you will live without the daily threat of war. I myself do not believe in a major nuclear war. I'm one of the few people presently active in the US government who has seen nuclear explosions. I've seen eight. Three of them hydrogen, two of them, uh, five of them uh, atomic. And that is a very sobering experience. I was talking to Marshal Akramyev, who is the chairman of the Soviet Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he said, I've seen them too, and it is a very sobering experience. I have a rather closer illustration than that. I know two young, a young security officer who's a girl, and she just got married, and she married a federal marshal. And I said, well, I wish you a long and happy marriage. She said, it's got to be. I said, why does it have to be? She said, we've both got guns. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be happy. Uh, we still have the tough problems of the Israeli-Arab quarrel and Cyprus, after, if I think we're able to solve the ones I described to you. We will have regional problems. I do not believe we will have a major confrontation with the Soviet Union, maybe in the lifetime of the youngest of you here, but certainly not most of you. They have discovered that they've got to change their system if they're to be competitive. Right now, except in weaponry and arms, the Soviet Union is the most advanced of the underdeveloped countries. Mr. Gorbachev understands that. He would like to be one of the most advanced of the developed countries. One of his problems, and it's lying ahead, is a tough one. When he starts closing down, the inefficient factories, the factories that produce shoddy goods that won't sell abroad. He's going to have 10 million unemployed in a country which has always boasted since the revolution that they had no unemployment. And that's when he's going to need his armed forces like never before. So you will see many changes in the Soviet Union, but you will not see, in my opinion, much change in the Soviet military budget. The Soviet general said to me, when that time that I just described comes, he will need us more that any general secretary of the party has needed us since the Germans stood 12 miles from Red Square. So that should not be the sole barometer. The barometer should be what else happens, what he does with the Eastern European countries and uh, how he behaves generally in the world. We no longer see these frenzied efforts to project Soviet power into Vietnam, into Angola, into Central America. I can't prove this, but I'm convinced that the Soviets have told the Cubans, the Angolans, the Nicaraguans, uh, and their various other client states. We will not throw you to the wolves, but we can no longer give you aid on the scale on which we've been giving it to you. Five, five billion dollars a year to Cuba, three billion dollars to Angola, a billion and a half to Nicaragua. We're prowling over to whether to give the Contras 20 million dollars. They're giving a billion and a half a year. And they're not going to be able to keep that up. It's just too difficult for them. And uh, that is why I'm fairly optimistic about what I look ahead and see ahead of us. I think there's going to be, you know, there'll obviously be quarrels and difficulties, and there'll be posturing, just as you're seeing, between the Iranians and Iraqis. I'm not going to buy that. I will resume the war first. And the Soviets saying, I'm going to suspend my withdrawal from Afghanistan. They won't. In Afghanistan, they found a situation which they could have avoided if they'd read Kipling. When writing to the British Tommy, he said, save the last bullet for yourself before you fall into the hands of the Afghan women. Uh, and that is a painful truth that they've had to learn the hard way. In my opinion, they made the decision for peace. They will withdraw from Afghanistan because Afghanistan poisons their relationship with China. They would like to get back closer to China, and I think they will, and I'm not particularly alarmed by it because they'll never go back to where they were, unconditional allies. The Chinese have stated there are three obstacles to a rapprochement with the Soviet Union. One, Afghanistan. Two, Vietnam. Three, the presence of Soviet garrisons along the Chinese border. They've eliminated one. In my opinion, in the next six months, they will eliminate Vietnam. Then, they could not put the garrisons anywhere but on the Chinese border because the Trans-Siberian Railway ran right along the Chinese border. In the last five years, they have built a parallel line 
250 miles north of the Trans-Siberian, and they can move the garrisons back to that. Since there are very few roads in the Soviet Union, when we were looking for their missile sites at the beginning, all we had to do was look along the railroad lines. And there they were, because they couldn't have any means of keeping them away from the railroad lines since road transport, particularly in Siberia, is practically non-existent. So now they can answer that third Chinese objection, which is the presence of the garrisons along the border. I see better party relations between them as they trust struggle to save a, a discredited system. And it's interesting to watch how different it is in the two countries. In China, where there's a long entrepreneurial tradition of somebody owning a little store and his brother and his sister and his uncle and his aunt and his niece work in the store, there was nothing like that in Russia. In the old days, you worked for a big landlord, and now then after that, you work for the biggest landlord of all, the state. Now, the Chinese have gone much further than the Soviets in introducing the profit motive, personal incentive, and ownership of land. But they haven't gone nearly as far as the Soviets in introducing tolerance of differing opinions. I only got four members of the Politburo that he put there. You know, working at the United Nations has a future. The new director of the KGB was a Soviet delegate to the United Nations in 1973. As I said, so was George Bush. So it's an area where there's a future for you if you're young enough. Uh, Maybe I make it sound too easy. It isn't going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of bump, bumps along the road. And we will get a good situation if we, don't peremp if we don't preemptively cave in on anything. And you know, there's a lot of complaint about the defense costs. We're spending 7% of our gross national product on defense. They are spending. Now, we were spending under President Kennedy against the much weaker Soviet Union, 9% of our gross national product. And no one complained about it then. Expensive as it is, it's an awful lot cheaper. To give an example, our $200 million a year dues to the United States, United Nations, is half the cost of keeping our naval presence in the Persian Gulf. So it's a good deal more economical to find political solutions for these things. And I think there's going to be an increasing move in that direction. There will always be. No one's ready to give up their national sovereignty yet. Not us, not them, not anybody. And I don't suggest that we do. But I suggest that we use the United Nations intelligently. We can talk to everybody there. When the United States decided to reestablish uh, diplomatic relations with Mongolia, I negotiated with the Mongolians in New York. And then they invited me to Mongolia. And I went there in a U.S. Air Force plane. It was the first U.S. Air Force plane in history ever to land in Mongolia. Kind of interesting. At Beijing, my pilot asked the Chinese, there's no airline between Beijing and outer Mongolia. You have to go in through the Soviet Union. What were the frequencies of the navigational aids? He said, there were none. Just follow the railroad. It'll lead you. <laughs> the weather was good and would let us. And we arrived in Mongolia. And they took me to see a statue of Stalin. And the Mongolian who was accompanying me around said in a low voice, take a good look at it. The next time you come here, it won't be there. <laughs> so that's an indication that even in outer Mongolia, changes are coming. I remember years ago, I used to say to my Soviet colleagues, Vyesnia idiot, spring is coming. You have the longest winter in the world, but spring is coming. And spring is coming. So we've got to stay the course. We've got to maintain a tough position to get the things that, the kind of agreements that will not give them a special advantage. We've got to be reasonable and understand that they have national interests that interest them, and they have friends and allies with whom they have to maintain relationships. But I would say that we have a less tense situation than we've had at any time since the end of World War II. And they know our system is working, and they know theirs isn't. I was in Bulgaria the other day, and the Prime Minister, the General Secretary of the Bulgarian Communist Party, who's been there longer than anybody else in Eastern Europe, said to me, well, you can say what you like, but the Marxist system is the most generous. I said, General Secretary, it's the most generous, the most noble, the most unselfish. It has only one drawback. If it doesn't work in the largest and richest country in the world, the Soviet Union, how can you expect it to work here? He said, I know perestroika's coming. He didn't say it with any enthusiasm, I might add. But anyway, the message I have for you is the United Nations is finally doing that for which it was created, stopping wars. It's finally become a place where you don't just scream abuse at one another, where you try and meet and work out solutions, and you try and find a way to solve problems without the loss of life. None of this may be in keeping with this stuff.
but it's real. Thank you very much. Any questions? Here. Here, we've got enough time. Uh, probably about five minutes. Ten? Yeah. And you can answer a lot of questions in okay. five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we have enough time for about five minutes of questions, so uh, we could uh, have people come down the aisle. Their microphones are out there, and the ambassador has kindly consented to answer any of your questions. Can I have 10 so I won't be accused of evading answers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here's one right over here. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. On. Yeah, it's all right. In Guatemala, 1981, there were at least 2,000 peasants massacred by Guatemalan security forces. You went on to state that the U.S. will continue to help them defend peace and liberty. With regard to other oppressive governments, i.e. Chile, Brazil, El Salvador, etc., you have continually supported them even as they violated human rights. When questioned about the human rights violations, you declared there will be human rights problems in the year 3000 with the governments of Mars and the Moon. There are some problems that are never resolved. General Walters, is this laissez-faire attitude to oppressive governments universal or just specific to those third world nations where we can reap economic gain? I think that statement of position was written. I think that statement of position was written before I spoke earlier this morning. In 1981, I went three times to see the president of Guatemala to tell him he had to change his ways. We gave no aid to the Guatemalan government, even though they were saying our young pilots are being killed for lack of spare parts. The United States passed, and while I was in the United Nations, passed several resolutions condemning the violation of human rights in the countries you've just described. Cuba, however, had a free ride until last year, a country which had more political prisoners per capita than any other in the world. But last year, we finally dragged them before the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations in Geneva. And it's very interesting. We gave a list of prisoners and asked Castro to release them. He said he wouldn't because he didn't have them, but he did. 800 prisoners that he claimed he didn't have. The United States has opposed every government, whether it's Mr. Carter or Mr. Nixon or Mr. anybody you want, has always opposed the violation of human rights. How can you, in a country where the president is elected popularly, take a stand in favor of violation of human rights? You would never get anywhere in the election, and nobody that has believed that ever has. And I, again, violations of human rights in the year 3000. In the year 3000, there'll be housing problems, there'll be traffic problems. I was merely trying to say that the struggle against violation of human rights has no end. As Washington said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. General, I wanted to uh, simply point out that a couple of weeks. Come to the microphone. Many more people will hear you. Come, come, come. Here, as a speaker, he can tell to the American audience what is the truth. If you want to, qu uh, I want to also point out. I want to point out the twenty. Say, if you want to ask a question... There are microphones. Come down. A lot more people will hear you than screaming hysterically in the balcony. I want to point out that the United States just approved the sending of 20,000 M-16s to Guatemala. That is not, in my opinion, uh, the kind of support that we ought to be giving Guatemalan citizens, sir. Uh, I think you will note that the United Nations, which follows these matters rather closely, has eliminated the position of a rapporteur for the violation of human rights in Guatemala. Mr. Cerezo is no friend of the military. He was a member of the left of center Christian Democrats. He is governing under a democratic constitution. If we don't sell them, they'll simply buy them from the French or get them for nothing from the Russians. You're perfectly free. We live in the kind of society where you can. There are only a few countries in which you can do that. <laughs> Speak up a little bit. That mic uh, doesn't seem to be working. 
second time I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak. First time was at one of the Watergate hearings. Uh, I would like to compliment you on your remarkable health prophecies as regards, for example, the what you term revolution in Brazil. I was wondering if you could tell us, looking into the future, what you foresee, for example, in Peru, where perhaps the narrow luminoso becomes a real threat. What the U.S. response under President Bush will do or be, given what seems to be a pattern of endemic insurgency in Central America, although it seems you disagree with a fair amount of people here about the cost. I would think that our policy will be what it has been in the past, to encourage the democratic forces to support the democratically elected government, unless it goes into what is clearly a non-democratic path. Peru is a particularly difficult case. The economy is a shambles, as it is in Argentina and Brazil. And curiously, the dictatorial regime in Chile is the only one that's produced continuous economic growth. But still, it's not worth the cost, as the people of Chile rightly chose. I would say the U.S. position will be to try and help these countries as far as we can. Sendero Luminoso already is a very serious threat. It already is a very serious threat. It's a rather difficult movement because it seems to be based basically on terrorism. It's really an Indians against the rest business. And it doesn't seem to have any program or policies that you can follow. It's a very confusing situation. When President Reagan became president of the United States, there were nine dictatorships in Central America and South America. Now there are three. It's not a bad record. And two of them, I might add, are leftist. Yes? Of uh, Chile, a few times this morning, and you've said that although some right-wing right dictatorships may be reprehensible <clears throat> in kind of along the same lines of thinking as uh, Jim Kirkpatrick, in that they are more acceptable than Communist no, they are more replaceable. Okay, anyhow, I apologize. Finish. Anyhow, how can we say that we are so concerned with human rights when, in fact, we established these dictatorships, such as in 73, when the CIA basically plotted and instrumented the overthrow of Salvador Allende, the democratically elected president? Um, which your involvement, which I'm sure you will deny. Uh, what is going to be the next step to undermine, say, the will of the Chilean people in the upcoming future now that Pinochet has so graciously given them a chance to vote? Well, to start out to these questions in regard to uh, Chile, in 1973, what the CIA had done was very carefully investigated by Senator Church, who was no friend of the CIA. I myself, on the instructions of the president, sent word to the CIA station in Chile that it should have no contact with the Chilean military. Senator, Chase, after ex Senator Church, after exhaustingly pursuing this, reluctantly came to the conclusion, and this you may check in the record, that the CIA had nothing to do with the overthrow of Mr. Allende. Mr. Allende was a democratically elected president of Chile with 36% of the vote. Uh, president Pinochet was de defeated with 44% of the vote. We recognized the will of the people. We had no part whatsoever in the overthrow of Salvador Allende. And as I say, you have access to freedom of information. You can go and get any of the files covering this matter. You can go and get any of the files relating to any of these things. And if they're factual, Publish them. They haven't. It's, you know, they accused Mark McCarthy of smearing. He was smearing on the right. The smearing is now on the left. They make these statements that I've just read out here without one ounce of fact to back them up. Maybe that's permissible. Different standard. in uh, Southwest Africa or Namibia, the only democratically or the only force that the UN calls democratic 
the only group that they count is Democratic is SWAPO, a Soviet-backed group. If they're the only democratically-backed group by the UN, and the UN is holding the elections, how do we expect any freedom-loving groups or anybody that's not communist or not socialistic anyway to gain any power there? Well, I think there will be a rather large contingent of UN peacekeeping troops, and a number of them will be from non-communist and non-communist sympathizing countries. And they will be in a position to see whether there is any major fraud there or not. Uh, it is not as though there were only countries from the East, but of course, as I said earlier, in the United Nations, you don't have much of a choice. About one third, one quarter, or 16, about one quarter of the countries in the UN are democratic. The rest are one party or one man, dictatorships. Well, if the UN only calls one group democratic, they can have elections, but they're only going to have one group in power. Well, uh, you know, when they get 98% of the votes, you know how democratic they are. That's the kind of elections you have in these countries. It's just one name on the ballot and sign here. But Namibia is not a communist country. It's a, they want to have it UN administered. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. What's that? Would you repeat it, please? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear Namibia it. I said Namibia is, uh, they want to have it UN administered, and that's the kind of election you're talking about. Do you think that the UN should sponsor these, these uh, communist-style elections also? I think the UN should hold a fair election. If any communist government has ever been elected by a popular ballot, I don't know where it was. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Oh, here's one over here. The 1961 mccloy zorin Agreement between the U.S. and the Soviet Union set out a framework for, quote, general and complete disarmament. Both countries agreed that disarmament required, quote, effective international control. This document was later adopted unanimously in the U by the UN. The heads of state of India, Mexico, Sweden, Greece, Tanzania, and Argentina have, have jointly proposed, quote, the establishment of an integrated multinational verification system within the UN to ensure that, quote, agreement to destroy weapons or to refrain from their development are strictly complied with. My question is, do you see a success or an approval of that opinion in the UN? That matter is presently under discussion in the UN as to what position to take. Very few countries are technically in a position to determine whether nuclear weapons have been done away with or not. You have to have very sophisticated means of recognizing whether a weapon has been hidden, put away, stored away, or actually removed from the arsenal of that country. And a number of the countries you cited are not democracies. Uh, I would just point out that both Mexico and India vote against the United States in the United Nations far more than does the Soviet Union. But the matter you refer to is under study right now. Okay, I think that will be it. Okay, thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.